Hi everybody, I'm Diane Brady. I'm here with Alexi Robichaud, who is the co-founder and CEO of BetterUp, which has a big presence on the promenade. Alexi, let's talk about why are you in Davos? What brought you here? And welcome. Well, thanks for having me. We're, we're in Davos because we're at our core about helping people build more trust and more leadership capabilities in their organizations. So the theme resonates. So the theme deep. resonates deeply. And um, you know, I think one thing that's special about Davos is you have so many of the world's thought leaders, so many of the world's literal leaders, and these are folks who can make positive change, and we want to be part of that. So it's um, a tsunami of stuff about AI yep. here, obviously there's the geopolitical comp. Give me some sense of the conversations you're having. How much is wellness, mental health, coaching actually factoring into what people are concerned about? I think um, it's coming up a, quite a lot, more than I expected, in the conversation of AI. And I, I think the context there is, um, People still have a very tired, in some ways more fragile than they would want, workforce coming out of the pandemic. And uh, if we could have painted the perfect chapter, it would not have been, then let's disrupt ourselves again with generative AI. And right. so I think there's, there's well-founded anxiety around that. And I think as part of this is I want to equip my people to uh, incorporate AI into their lives, to use it for good, but at the same time, I need to understand that they may not be at the level of resilience I want, so how do I foster that resilience so that they can actually make the most of what is a really powerful capability? So, life is about choices and attention span, and certainly coming out of the pandemic, there was a lot of concern about how are our people doing, are there mm -hmm. engaged talent shortages? Now with AI, there's this panic to, am I investing enough yeah. in AI? Does that shift the calculus for how much we pay attention to the realm that you're in? I don't think in aggregate it shipped the calculus. I think it's changed the equation, mm -hmm. to stick with the metaphor. Okay. Prior to Thank the pandemic, oh, I'm, yeah, I'm here to help. <laughs> Prior to the pandemic, um, I think a lot of CHOs and CEOs were investing in employee experience, um, seemingly for the sake of employee experience, but in great part because they knew it drove better retention. And remember, mm -hmm. that you remember, this was the talent war, right? Right. Re attracting and keeping top talent was an imperative. Companies were succeeding or failing based on that. And so employee experience was the equation for why we invest. I think the investments have stayed, but the equation has changed. Now it's about innovation and performance. But the reality is flourishing and well-being underpin all these things. And so I think the math is different and that it's like, I may not be investing so my employees like me more. That may not be the, the, the equation anymore. I'm investing so they're more innovative, they're more agile, they're more creative. But actually what I'm investing in is the exact same thing. I'm investing in their well-being. I'm investing in their cognitive agility. I'm investing in their learning abilities. And I'm investing in their resilience. And yeah. so that has not changed. In fact, we see, I'd say, an aggregate investment increasing because in some ways it's easier for business leaders now to tie this to business performance. So I'd be remiss not to ask you about AI and how sure. you think about it. And how does that change or enhance the nature of what you're doing? We think it's an enhancer. Um, we're very privileged to work with a lot of leading research labs in academia. One of our favorite is the Stanford Social Media Lab. They don't create AI, but they study perception related to AI. Mm -hmm. And what we continue to find is that no one, want, well I shouldn't say no one, very few people want only an AI coach, and very few people want only a human well, coach. What's an AI coach? It's kind so of like... So there's like a coach bot or something, right? Uh, yeah, no, I know, yeah. but it just sounds awful it, to me. Well, yeah. that's probably why people don't want it. Um, what most people want is both, and they want both depending on context. When they're talking about deeply personal and emotional things, they want to start with a human and potentially be escalated to an AI. Mm -hmm. And when they're talking about things where there's a corpus of knowledge to master, uh, salary negotiation, what should I do in this situation, um, it's rather straightforward. They actually want to start with an AI, and then if they need additional help, work with a human. So all of our products, our roadmap, actually braids this human intelligence and this artificial intelligence together. And we think the future is getting really good at triage and helping people understand who is the right interventionist in the moment. Is it a human? with a lot of human experience and wisdom, or wisdom of the practitioner, as we would say in the mm -hmm. industry, or is it an AI with a huge amount of knowledge and pattern recognition? And I think the magic of this is it should be both. Americans, we don't get out that much, and here we are in Davos, where here we are, we're out, good for us. Good for but us. As you talk to what's like, when you've talked to leaders in Europe, Asia, other parts of the world, how are the conversations different? Yeah, well, I, fun fact, I'm also European, so oh, well, I get to get out more. I get SMI, to get out more. SMI. Well, congratulations, like yes. Of what fair lands are you a citizen? Sit, um, Scotland, ergo, British, Brit all right, I'm Canada. Greek. I'm not supposed yeah. to keep all those passports. Yeah, well, we sh we'll cut that part out. Um, 
I, I, I do think my sense, again, you're asking me, is there is more pessimism towards AI from European counterparts and more optimism from AI from American counterparts. What about the wellness and the role of the employer in fostering wellness? Because it feels like it's a very different relationship with the state yes. and with one's employer. Yes. So I, that must change things too. Yeah, it's, it's actually fascinating. So I think Europeans have a great respect for it and they prioritize it, but a lot of that is done by the government. And so mm -hmm. I actually think American corporations have to and do put more of that on their shoulders. Yeah. So in some ways, as a general characterization, you might say European companies are more progressive in valuing it. In many ways, American organizations are more sophisticated in how they deliver it because they have to be. So one thing that's intrigued me with this um, Edelman Trust Barometer, we've seen mm -hmm. this polarization, it's manifesting itself in how people think about innovation, this 40 point difference between Republicans and Democrats. That polarization's coming into the workplace. Is that something you think about or you're seeing with your customers? Absolutely. How do they deal with that? I think employee activism is one of the CHROs and CEOs top one or two priorities. Um, and I think most uh, in my conversations with them often we're mutually coaching one another. People are arriving at, I think, a pretty simple equation that we need to get back to civility. Mm -hmm. And if we want to live in a pluralistic society, the number one virtue is toleration. And we need to bring that into the workplace. We need to be okay with people are you disagreeing. Helping with that? Yeah, I think coaching so I, is. Am I loading too much on your back there? No. Uh, I, 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 we don't. We don't. I mean, it's hard to coach specifically around one topic, so to speak, but I think we coach a lot around how do you have the openness, how do you have the vulnerability, how do you have the appreciation for others' viewpoints. And I think things like, you know, techniques like appreciative inquiry, these are things that need to go in every leader's toolboxes, and we absolutely coach related to that. I'd be remiss not to mention, you've been building out, um, almost from a research capability, you've had Adam Grant mm -hmm. join, you've got Prince Harry, um, and very, tell me what the ambition is. Why, what are you adding there that um, you don't already have? Yeah, so we often think about our job at Better Up is to go, to use a pharmaceutical analogy, bench to bedside. We want to take the best science in the world, and why is science important? One, it's, it's truth as a method, but really it's repeatable. And we're talking about wanting to positively impact the lives of billions of people at scales. The most important thing is scalability, which is repeatability. So we need to start with replicable science. So that, creating playbooks? Exactly, and then we basically productize that into our platform, and we are a vehicle to deliver that to and millions of workers so worldwide. Adam Grant brings thought leadership? He brings what? research, okay. intervention. So what works? So if we say, fast, hey, right. we want to, yeah, he's a professor at Wharton. If we want to change how a leader deals with conflict, so they're more open, or they're more uh, encouraging of di dissent, mm -hmm. what do we do? Tactically, how do we do that? And so we get to work with them on the literature, we get to build interventions together, and then we get to deploy that and see if it works and test it. We get to contribute to creating new knowledge and science as a feedback loop and our customers and their employees get the benefit of that. So let me ask what worries you. I know that um, maybe not much, but as, as you've had some of the conversations this week and at home, what are you concerned about? Any pain points for you? I think there's a general perception um, that the most at-risk populations for disruption, job populations for disruption, are frontline workers from AI. Well, I think it's and the likes of me. I, well, I, I actually <laughs> think that's the worry. I actually think it's creative economy in many ways. Not that they'll be completely replaced, but that we'll need less of them yeah, because so much of knowledge work is iteration and throwing ideas against the wall, and AI can be really good at that. But I'm not sure we're providing the emotional support and really the reconfiguration of people's identity and value around their career to what does your job look like in that. And these tend to be the leaders in organizations. This tends to be upper middle management. This tends to be middle management. And I actually think in many ways they will have a more destabilizing journey over the next three to four years than the common zeitgeister narrative would lead us to believe. And the reality is they are in the influential positions. And so yeah. stabilizing managers and leaders is the number one thing you want to do if you're a senior leader at a company. And, and reinvent yourself. And reinvent yourself. Excellent. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us.